Genesis 12, 1 through 6, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will, <clears throat> I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set <coughs> out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Thank you, Tom. You may be seated. So, David, I was wondering, um, you know, when you get to start riding an assisted bike. Huh? <laughs> I know you'll keep going as long as you can. Praise God for that. Uh, yesterday evening was a great time, and I appreciate so much Christy and Alan and everybody who had a part in, in making the uh, baby shower for Isaac and Sandra so, so wonderful. Uh, we got a little bit of a tutorial in African time. Uh, the shower was supposed to start at 4, and the guests of honor got there around 5. And many of their relatives got there at 6 and 6.30, and some of them bringing massive amounts of food at that time. In Africa, you start whenever everybody gets there, not at a specific time like we do here in the U.S. So it's kind of funny. I, I appreciate everyone's patience on that. And we had to cut out. We had another event to get at. We hated to, to not help clean up and things. But everybody had a part in that. Thank you so very much. Let's imagine for just a minute that you are lost in the desert, and it's so hot, and, and your mouth is just parched, and your throat is so dry, and you think, if I could just have a sip of water, I'd give anything for a sip of water. Then all of a sudden, you see up ahead something, what looks like a water pump, and as you get closer, you you notice that there's something hanging from it, and you get even closer, you realize what's hanging from it is a canteen. There's a message on the canteen. And the message says this, Beneath your feet is all the fresh, cool water you will ever need. But the pump will not work unless it's primed with water. The canteen contains enough water to prime the pump. But if you drink any of the water first, the pump will not work. You take that canteen in your hand, you shake it, and you can hear and feel the water inside. What do you do now? Should you believe the promise written? Or is it just a hoax? What if there's nothing beneath this dry sand? What if the only water for miles is what's in that canteen? If you trust the sign, you may be pouring your very life away. But a decision must be made. Will you drink from the canteen? Or will you take the only water you've seen for days and pour it down the throat of that pump? Will you trust in what you can touch and see? Or will you have faith in the promise? Abraham was a man who believed the promise of God. Many times in his life, Abraham came to the point where what he had to go on was the equivalent of a canteen and a promise. And yet, as we'll see in this series, he was repeatedly willing to believe God's promise. So he poured that canteen and primed the pump of God's blessing in his own life and in the life of his descendants. 
Abraham was an ordinary man with an extraordinary willingness to place his trust in the promises of God. And yet, as we'll see in our series, as exemplary as he was, he was not perfect in his journey of faith. Like him, none of us are going to be perfect in our journey of faith either. So last week we started this series by discussing the benefits of studying biographies, especially biographies of biblical characters. And today I want us to look at the beginning of Abraham's story and to see his first steps of faith. And as I said last week, the life of Abraham teaches us much about this matter of walking with God by faith. And since that is, after all, the goal that God has for all his children to learn to walk by faith, Abraham has a lot to teach us. So let's begin with the story. Abraham was originally called Abram. You notice that in our reading this morning. It was not until years later that God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And when God changes people's names, it's usually a, a significant moment or time. And we'll see that when we get to that part of Abraham's story. And hopefully you won't be confused, but throughout the series, I'm just going to call him Abraham rather than call him Abram now and later call him Abraham. And then we'll all get confused and, and all so we meet Abraham for the first time in the closing verses of Genesis 11 and in the opening verses of Genesis 12 that Tom read for us just a minute ago. Let's look at that context. The Bible says there, starting at Genesis 11:27, this is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. When they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, you and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they'd accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. They arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. It's important for us to understand that there was a time in that distant past, some 4,000 years ago, when Abraham was a mere nobody. Abraham had humble beginnings. He was just another one of those nameless faces in the crowd of humanity. Born in the Chaldean city of Ur in Mesopotamia, he lived many years of his life in obscurity. As you can see on the screen, the, the map of that area, the Ur of the Chaldeans, located in what today we call Iraq. In the southeast corner of Iraq, some 75 miles north of the Kuwait border. It was at Abraham's time located a place where the Euphrates River emptied into the Persian Gulf. And at that time it was a bustling seaport. History also says the city was a center of intellectual activity. A large public library has been unearthed containing thousands of ancient texts written on clay. That region was also well suited for raising flocks and herds. Which may account for the fact that Abraham for his whole of his life, was involved in 
herding sheep and cattle. But another important thing we know from history about Ur is that it was a stronghold for idol worship. And although everybody in the world at one time had understood there was only one true God, the Creator God, people over time had begun to worship other gods. They had invented these gods, right? They worshipped a pantheon of mythical gods ruled by the moon god, Nana, who they regarded as the Lord of Heaven, the divine creator. And you see his picture there, he's sitting on the throne with the moon kind of above his hand. So like his relatives and neighbors, before God appeared personally to Abraham, Abraham likely worshipped idols. He likely accepted myth as truth. You say, well, how do you know that? Look with me at Joshua chapter 24, verses 2 and 3, where Joshua, who succeeded Moses in leading Israel into the promised land, reminded the Israelites with these words, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. So if Terah, the father of Abraham, worshipped other gods, there's a very good possibility that Abraham did as well, right? And how wonderful it is to realize that God chose Abraham by grace. It's doubtful that Abraham had even heard of the one true God before God intervened in his life and appeared to him. And so by an act of pure grace, God dipped his hand into that idolatrous hole and selected Abraham out of all the people. And the Lord chose Abraham for reasons known only in heaven. The Lord called Abraham out of the most wretched conditions, spiritually speaking. And when we get right down to it, you and I are no different than Abraham, right? Now, we may not have worshipped a pantheon of gods made of stone or anything else or heavenly bodies, but we're all trapped in that same darkness that enveloped the life of Abraham before we knew God. It thrills me to know that we serve a God who can reach into the blackest heart and turn on the light of his glory. I praise God. He can take a life that was so hopeless and barren as Abraham's or ours and turn it into one of the greatest examples of the power of faith and grace that can be found anywhere. And so I hope the point that we realize is this. Regardless of where we came from, regardless of what baggage we may carry with us now, God is able to come where we are to change us for his glory. No one is beyond the touch of God. Not even a pagan idolater like Abraham and his family. Now the scriptures kind of pass over Abraham's early life in Ur with only a brief mention. And to me it's as if God's saying that Abraham's real life didn't begin until his encounter with God. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, that first Christian martyr, gave a speech where he told about that time when God intervened in the life of Abraham. This is how Stephen tells it. Brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he arrived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said. Go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. So we're not told how the call actually came to Abraham. Wouldn't you like to know a little more about that, right? Have a little more of that picture of how did it happen? What we do know is God spoke to him in his darkness and called him into the light to follow a new path. Abraham was called to leave behind everything he loved, everything he he was familiar with everything that had shaped his life up to that point. He's ordered to leave his region, ordered to leave his religion, ordered to leave his relatives. For this man or for anyone else, 
that would be a hard call, wouldn't it? He was to leave his home, not knowing where he's going or when he would arrive. He was to leave all such matters in the hand of the Lord. So when the call of God does come into a life, it's a call for the person to sever ties with their past. It's a call to a new life with new priorities and a new Lord. The call requires total commitment. God calls us to leave behind the old life and begin a new life of faith where every moment is lived in utter dependence upon the Lord alone for our every need. God calls us to follow him without being concerned about the destination. We must leave the details to him. God calls us to follow him regardless of the cost, regardless of where it leads, regardless of how much it hurts. It's a daily, moment-by-moment moment walk of faith. So when we look at Abraham's call and we look at his response to the call, it appears he failed to fully submit to God's call. Remember, God's command was leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Stephen tells us all that occurred in Ur of Chaldeans before he left there to go to Haran. So the Bible says they came to Haran and they stopped there. Now, looking at the map again, you realize Haran is not Canaan. They didn't make it all the way. They stopped. This was not where God had called Abraham to go. He had not gone all the way for the Lord. We notice also that he failed to separate from his family, right? Who did he bring with him? Sarah, his father, his nephew Lot. We notice Abraham didn't leave Haran until his father died. And in that sense, Terah was a roadblock between Abraham and his doing of God's will. So I would encourage each of us to ask ourselves, what has the Lord told me to do that I haven't yet done? Have you or I fallen short in the obedience department? Now I know firsthand all of God's commands are not easy to follow, are they? Some are difficult, some are frightening. Some are costly, but all are to be obeyed by the child of God who wishes to walk by faith and who wants to be found pleasing to the Lord. Let's allow Tara for just a minute to represent the flesh or other things that might hinder our progress in the things of God. So what is your Tara today? If we aren't exactly where the Lord wants us to be, if we aren't exactly doing what the Lord wants us to do, then we have a terror. We have a roadblock hindering our progress of obedience to God. What is the thing that might be holding you back this morning? Additionally, I would encourage us to be careful that we don't become a terror, a roadblock for someone else. If we're not careful, we might just find ourselves being the terror of somebody else's life. We must not let our lack of faith prevent someone else from following God fully. But in the end, I would encourage us to always remember, partial obedience is simple disobedience, right? Partial obedience to God is really not obedience. Partial obedience is ultimately disobedience. Remember that incident with Saul? I did do what you told me to do, right? Well, not completely. Mm. Until we've done all that God says to do, we haven't done what God said to do. Now, thankfully, God was patient with Abraham, right? And finally brought him along to a more complete obedience. Got him finally to the promised land. And thankfully, God is also very patient with each of us to move us towards more complete obedience of our lives to him. But it's better for us to hear God's voice and to respond in immediate action, complete obedience, 
without delay. Otherwise, it is disobedience. So as we near the conclusion of our investigation of this part of Abraham's story, I want us to notice the promises God gave Abraham. Look at this again. Leave your country, your people, your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Think about those things. First of all, he would make Abraham into a great nation nation of Israel. It didn't exist before it began with Abraham. And remember, at this time, he has no descendants, right? He has a wife who is childless. Yet God is promising to make him into a great nation with many descendants. He promised he would make Abraham's name great. Is, is there a name much greater than the name of Abraham in terms of world renowned? Three faiths kind of look to Abraham as a great leader, right? He promised to protect Abraham through the process, and we'll see how that plays out as we investigate his life. He also promised to make Abraham a blessing to all the people on the earth. Now, that's a big blessing. Imagine God saying that, I'm going to use you to bless all people, not just a few, all people on the face of the earth. And, of course, we see that coming through the seed of Abraham in the person of Christ. Consider the fact that Abraham didn't know how God would work it all out. Great promises, but how in the world is God going to work all those out? See, God wants us to have the faith that Abraham had to trust in God's promises, even when we have no idea how God could work it out. It seems impossible to us, and yet all things are possible with God. See, God wants us to come to that place where we can simply take him at his word and be satisfied in our hearts that he will do as he promises. Regardless of what the devil or the flesh or the world will tell us, we trust God. Every one of his promises are true. We take it to the bank, right? Now for application, just for a second. I want to end today's lesson with the two commands that I think we see couched in God's promises to Abraham. He gave him these two commands, and the first command is go, right? God commanded Abraham to go, and it meant for him to leave the known and the familiar for the unknown and the unfamiliar. And when God commands us to go, it often means that we have to let go in order to go. I like the story of the man who was hiking out in the woods one day and he came to the edge of a cliff and he fell off and he's falling down into this great ravine. He grabs onto a branch. You've probably heard this story. I've probably used it numerous times before. He's holding onto the branch. He looks down. It's hundreds of feet down. He knows he can't let go there. He looks up. He sees he can't climb up, so he just starts to shout for help. Help, help, somebody up there, help, help, help. And after crying out for quite some time and hearing no response, he finally heard a voice. And the voice said, Jack, can you hear me? And the man replied, yes, I hear you. I need your help. Who are you? And the voice replied, Jack, this is God. And I can help you. Do you trust me, Jack? And Jack said, oh, I trust you, God, and if you'll get me down from here safely, I'll do anything for you. God said, easy on the promises, just a minute. Let's just get you down from there, all right? Now, here's what I want you to do. Listen carefully. I want you to let go of the branch. Jack said, you want me to do what? God said, I said, let go of of the branch, trust me, and let go. I will catch you. And after a long pause, Jack yelled, help, help, is there anybody else up there who can help me? That's a lot like what God asked Abraham to do, right? Leave your country your people, your father's household, 
you go to the land, I will show you. Abraham may have asked, okay, God, but, but where, are we, where are we going? And, and, and how are we going to get there? And, and how long is it going to take? And all the other questions probably came to his mind. And God said, do you trust me? Let go. I also get a chuckle when I think about Abraham going home to Sarah and telling her about his conversation with God. Sarah, time to pack up the things. We're going to move. Okay, where are we going? I don't know. Have you lost your mind? Sometimes God calls us out of our comfortable, convenient spots so we can be more productive. And when the call comes, we must go and we must let go. When's the last time you tried something new in your Christian walk and service? Is God trying to move you out of your comfort zone, prod you into something new? Are you willing to trust God by going and letting go? The second command God gave to Abraham that's couched in his promises is to be a blessing. And as we answer God's call, as we go, as we let go, let's be a blessing along the way. God promised to bless Abraham, but he did so that Abraham might be a blessing. See, God doesn't bless us so we can poured his blessings to ourselves. He blesses us so we can share those blessings with others. When Robert Louis Stevenson, the great Scottish novelist, was 12 years old, he was looking out the dark of his upstairs window one night, watching a man light the street lamps. Now, this is a stretch for those of us who flip switches and things like that, but imagine a time when there was no electricity for lights. And the person would literally walk down the street and light with a long wick the street lights one by one by one. Someone came to, to his room and said, hey, what are you looking at? Stevenson said, I'm watching a man cut holes in the darkness. What a vivid picture. Of, of the blessing that God wants us to be as we go, letting go, that we're cutting holes in the spiritual darkness of the world around us. Love that. He wants us to be a blessing. And we can do it wherever we are, whatever position we're in. We can be a blessing in our own families. Sometimes there are a spiritual dark place, right? We can be a blessing in the workplace. We can be a blessing in the neighborhood or the school or anywhere. We can be a blessing in big ways. Or we can be a blessing in small ways. Of course, you've heard the story of the boy walking on the seashore in that morning when all the starfish had been left by, by uh, the tide going out, right? And he's walking along and he's trying to throw them all back into the sea to help them so they won't die. And along comes an old man who stops the young boy. And he says to him, he says, there must be tens of thousands of starship on this beach. I'm afraid you really won't make much of a difference. The boy bends down, picks up another starfish, throws it as far as he can out in the water. He said, I made a difference for that one. Sometimes we're overwhelmed by the tens of thousands and the need. And God's not saying you got to take care of it all, right? Be a blessing where you can, how you can, big ways and small ways. There's an old saying that goes, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, right? It took Abraham a while to really get going, but he eventually made that step. And when he did, God began to bless him, 
and make him a blessing? What steps of faith have you made so far in your faith journey? Praise God for the steps you've made so far in that faith journey. But what steps of faith do you still need to make today, tomorrow, in the future, so that you can be blessed and so that you can be a blessing? So let's be like Abraham. Let's answer God's call which means we've got to go and we've got to let go and trust God so that we can be blessed and so that we can be a blessing.